So um, today, I guess some of you have probably done some modeling in your work. Um, maybe with a show of hands, how many of you are actively modeling in your work daily? Just out of curiosity. Okay, so not so many. Well, that's not a lot. Yeah, well, I guess it was quite popular to do this maybe in the 90s. Um, <laughs> But why would you want to model? Um, I guess you're probably modeling in, in some form because you have to write up a design and typically you're going to have collaboration with fellow developers or maybe with an architecture group that's probably designing the system. So you're going to want to model at least in some form so that you can communicate what your intended design is going to be. That's probably pretty good engineering practice. And typically it's done on a whiteboard. Somebody will have an idea, we draw it up, have a discussion, and it will go and translate to code. You could do more formal modeling, where you actually use tools for this. Um, Motorola, where I was working before with Pavel. Um, right now, actually, we're, we were working on a gateway, um, which uh, connected two countries together. And basically, this gateway was responsible for uh, handling calls between these countries, very simply put. I think it's more complicated than that. But each of the uh, processes that were in this gateway in Erlang were representing individual calls. and. These calls uh, had to be modeled. The state machines that were responsible for handling those calls had to be modeled. So we decided to use tools for this. So two things. Not everybody at Motorola is an Erlang programmer, um, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so what we don't do is we don't just show some skeleton code to the developers that uh, would like to see uh, maybe like a working prototype or some way of visualizing what we intend to do in the state machine. So what you're not going to do is be able to um, sell people to read Erlang code. So what we want to have is we want to have some mini intermediate uh, visualization tools, at least like the whiteboard. Um, and it's difficult in this way because uh, it's difficult when you don't really have an idea of what you want to do. So uh, diff I mean, design in general is very difficult, but it's more difficult if you're alone in design. So. What graphics are gonna, or graphs uh, models are going to provide us uh, give you a quick overview and feedback mechanism, so there is a real need for doing this. There's some um, problems in general that come out of you know, having very complicated systems, especially if you have very large requirements, sometimes very, very thick documents. It's kind of frustrating if you get some of these things in the documents incorrectly and you're interpreting them incorrectly. Personally, I don't like to read a lot of documents. And it's very difficult sometimes to stay awake. <laughs> So it's nice to have graphs. For me, I like to read graphs. It makes it a lot easier for me to understand and translate to code what I need to do. Um, and it, in fact, some of the work that um, we've been doing is, is kind of frustrating in models because if you want to maintain models, it's a pain in the butt, so to say, so say it as simple as I can, because modeling is something that you do in design phase, typically. And the next time you go to play with the code again, it's typically already out of date with what's in the code. Um, so the other thing we have with modeling that's a real difficulty is people have an opinion about how to do it, and typically it's not uni uniform, and the agreements are always uh, very difficult to get on how to model. Um, and it's also difficult to map to code depending on the language. Uh, we're very fortunate to be using Erlang. I think Erlang uh, maps to certain modeling tools uh, quite well. Um, one of them is one that came out of Telecom, uh, uh, the, the, the SDL. I don't know how many of you know SDL. Um, okay. Well, SDL uh, was introduced in, in 76, and there's a graphical representation a version of this. Uh, they also have a textual version. I don't think many people use the textual version anymore, but the graphical representation is still used uh, in Motorola. We have some older components that are, are using this design. The other thing we used SDL for in our development is we had a lot of standards. Uh, we did, for instance, uh, Q signaling, which is on E1 channels. They had very, very thick documentation on how to do that, and I skipped a lot of this text-based documentation and went right to the appendix, which were beautiful graphs showing me exactly what I needed to do in the code, which made development of very old but very well-developed um, uh, documentation, or I should say the standard for, for QSIG, very easy to implement. And we were very successful in that implementation because we had those models. Um, when we actually connected to our competitor systems uh, in uh, integration testing, we had an implementation that we had developed in Airline using this documentation that was developed I would say probably in the 80s, and the system that was uh, developed, uh, our, our competitor system was made by, at that time, Nokia, now Airbus. Uh, they have a circuit switch network that's ancient, and they haven't changed their QSIG uh, in, in a very long time. So it was really nice to see you develop this stack with two developers in the course of, well, about a month and a half, plug this thing into code that's been running for years and years and years in a telecom system that's extremely stable, and it just works. So graphs have 
a lot of value. SDL has a lot of uh, components in that graph, but uh, there's only a few things that map really well to Erlang. This is an example of the actual QSIG standard. I copied some code that we actually used uh, from our Erlang implementation and tried to map it here so you could see exactly how easy it is to map. For instance, the state definition to the events that are being translated, and then you have actually the um, timer, uh, stop timer that was uh, put, this T303 for the QSIG, and then there's a release message. You can basically follow this quite easily in the code to the graph. Then uh, all of a sudden, things changed a bit. We got larger. Uh, we had 25 engineers instead of just a group of five, and a lot of engineers had, had a lot of experience in UML. So we started to develop more components, newer uh, components that uh, was very difficult to get everybody to agree how to do them in SDL because people did not have SDL experience. So we went to using UML for this. But UML, it's just a tool, and actually it's very similar in structure to SDL. You just have to get it to work for your, your need, your domain. UML can be used for almost anything, which makes it also very dangerous. But in general, mapping it to Erlang code, as I've also uh, shown here as an example, is relatively trivial if you have some structure that you agree on in the UML implementation. The other point that we we're going to demonstrate today is not just that you need models, but the other problems with models we'd like to eliminate. So me and Pavel, we came up with something outside of Motorola because the problem of having these models in Motorola uh, basically is very difficult to solve without some tools that work for us. And we actually came up with this idea of actually having a way to take existing Erlang FSMs and generate some visual representations of these FSMs so we can show our um, non-Erlang in engineers what we've actually done implemented so we can get quick validation that that was exactly what was intended. And that sounds much easier than it really is. <laughs> um, but in principle, I mean, when you make these designs and then you make changes to the code and then somebody comes in and says, oh, wait, this is wrong, and then you go and change this again, and do you really go back to that model you did and redraw all the arrows and the little states and maybe add something? Ah, maybe sometimes, maybe not. And actually, our experience is that the not part is the most common. So people don't really want to go back and, and re-edit all the models once they've been done. We've actually had this one major effort where we had to take our existing code and map it back so that the system architects could go in, take a look at that, and validate whether this is actually correct. This took about three days to go through a single Erlang module and draw it back onto UML. It's a very taxing process. And of course, in the process, we found that there's a lot of things that are wrong. And they had to be corrected. And no, we didn't really feel like going back and spending another three days on updating that diagram again. So now we have this huge diagram that's worthless, because it doesn't match the code at, in any way. So the main thing here is to generate this thing automatically, so that we don't have to go and by hand drag these little. I mean, there's a lot of tools to do UML, or I guess SDL as well. Um, and I mean, you, you know, you have to go into this Windows program, drag these little arrows, drag these little boxes here and there, type some things. It's, it's kind of painful. You can also do it in a textual format, but once your model gets really big, this, this will be very painful to do. So what we did is a, kind of a little tool that will actually read an Erlang source file. It will need all the include files you have there so that it can parse it. It will use the inbuilt Erlang pa parser and transform this into the very well-known abstra abstract syntax tree and then we'll go through that tree and trying to find out what are your states. And the states, we know that the GenFSM behavior is very well defined. We know exactly what a state function has to return. There's only so many possibilities that a state function can return. So if we detect that, oh, this actually returns a next state tuple, oh, this is probably a state. And going back that way, we can figure out what the states are. Of course, this is a much more complex problem when we have case statements inside the, the state that change how the transitions go. Uh, when we have the state actually being computed by another function and maybe returned when we have, I mean, there's a lot of crazy things you can do there uh, which are much harder to analyze. Um, so currently, we support the kind of like the most basic model where if you have a function clause also with case and if statements inside and you have some uh, next state tuples in there, we will find all these transitions. We are working on that, f on that, that now you could, if you have a, a state transitions inside a case clause, we can actually infer what is the condition to go to that branch and that branch. So we would, I mean, we, we're not exactly sure how to represent this yet, but the current idea is that we will just make it's kind of like an abstract substate or, or vertex that is the case itself, and this basically becomes like a decision block yeah. in, in UML or, or SDL. The other, the other point is that it's actually 
being put basically all of this uh, abstraction track tree that we've parsed in, we've put this into a di digraph. So digraph also module. And yeah, yeah, the digraph module that comes with OTP, we use that. So basically the tool, really what it does is it takes the abstract syntax tree and builds a di digraph. And out of that, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we've made, we've created two implementations, that one that goes into dot and one that goes into a JSON, but it's really up to anyone. Because as, we, as Nick already said, everybody likes their diagrams with a little bit fl different flavors, so everybody can just make their own uh, drawing or use their own drawing tool, whichever they prefer. Um, and the main difficulty is really making the digraph itself, not visualizing it. Um, you probably show them something. Yeah, I will. <laughs> uh, we also support all state events that we have uh, in, in OTP, and there's a GitHub link here if you would like to take a look. Yes. But just so we prove to you that we're not just making things up here and uh, pretending we have something. So we, I, we've made this example state machine. So this is a very, like the most basic state machine that you can write. Um, it has a couple states. They take some events, they make some transitions. There's a state here which has some nested case and if statements that do some weird things here. Uh, but there are also different possible transitions. There's some transitions that go back to the same state they came out of. And of course, there's some handle event and uh, ha generally all state events that also self-loop, actually. So what I'm going to do now is I'll uh, start the application. Can you see that? Is that big enough? Up? Oh, yeah. Oh. All right. I can do that. And we just say create graph. And we have to provide where the, where the source file is. There's no includes for this one. And let's say we want a dot file. So that just worked. I'm going to open it up now. And let's take a look. We have this tool here, an online tool that takes dot. There's a little thing I need to change here. But otherwise, I'll make a graph. And here it is. So all these state transitions that we've had in that code are now visualized, and we have a state machine diagram for that code we've just had. Um, I mean, you can have different visualization tools that use dot. I mean, there's quite a lot of them, I think. This is just one example of them. It draws quite nicely. Um, <laughs> you'll see later. Um, but we, what we also have is you can see that we, we saw that in the all state events case, we just passed the variable of the state, the state name back into the next state tuple. And our program kind of inferred that and found out, okay, so each state actually can do that. So we have these uh, handle event events in every state. Uh, another thing you can do, if you don't like dot, you could do JSON. And I will need to copy this to my web server. And if I run now, I've made this little utility in D3.js. You've maybe heard about this. This is just something that I whipped out really quickly to show that you could also take a JSON and, and use some kind of other utilities uh, to visualize it. This is not the prettiest. It wasn't a lot of time spent on this, but you can build something out of this later that'll be a bit more nice. Um, but OK, this is all fine. You can say, all right, we have this example FSM we've made. This is some very simple code. We've, uh, we've tinkered and made sure that our program actually runs for that, and then great. Um, but now I would like to use this, and what guarantee do I have that this actually runs? So how about instead of, um, instead of showing the example FSM, I'll take some Motorola production code and draw it up for you. So this is a state machine that is uh, responsible for maintaining a link to another entity in our network. Uh, this is kind of a link that's always supposed to be up. If the application is running, this link has to be up. If it's not up, then nothing is really working. Um, so this is not something that can be closed or, or opened. This is, it just links up, and then it stays in that state until you explicitly shut down the application and, and, and kill it. Um, and there's a little complicated, I guess, link up procedure that, that takes a while. There's a few different messages there. But um, let's take a look at it. So I'm going to make a dot out of it. And I'll take this into the web graph viz. And all right. 
So this is a this is a bit bigger. It looks something like that. This is a much more complicated state machine that has a lot more transitions and a lot more different things can be happening there. So, uh, but we can still see a few things here. So for example, here we have the initial state. So we always start in this state, wait, connect, when we are waiting for something. And eventually, we will get this message, connect. I don't know if you can see it here. This transition, then we'll wait for the grant message that the link is, is actually granted and so on and so forth. And as I said, this, this is never supposed to not try to connect. This, if the link goes down, we're supposed to keep trying and reconnect this link. But if we explicitly want to close it, then we have this stop all state event. So all these stops go to this terminate here on the right. So there's, of course, the limitations where, where, where somebody does some weird stuff, like computing the state out of whatever uh, fields that came in the event or something like that. Or if there is an actually a sub-function, instead of the next state at the end, there's like a function call, and that function returns the next state and things like that. Um, those are a bit more involved, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's possible to do. I think for us, it's actually going to be a huge benefit that we can give this in a few seconds to somebody. <laughs> and we don't have to be bothered to walk them through the code. They can at least look at this, get an idea of what's going on, and, and proceed to ask questions, and we can have a dialogue. Um, like Pablo was saying, it would be really good to have the conditional statements. We hope to have that for you today, but we're going to probably be working on that uh, quite soon. So I think that wraps up the rest of our um, Yeah, I mean, this is all on GitHub. Uh, so we, we welcome anybody who feels like yeah tinkering with this. Um, and one last thing I would like to say, because everybody seems to be saying it uh, today, is that uh, Motorola Copenhagen is, is looking for an Erlang programmer. So if, if Torben was asking if anybody likes to have a startup experience, and I'm asking the opposite, if anybody's tired of startups and maybe would like to do something different for a change. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> <laughs> so any questions? Do we have time, maybe? One question. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Will you update your README file on? Yeah. The oh yeah. <laughs> There's <laughs> no information yeah. in README. Yeah. We actually wanted to make sure people actually wanted to use the tool first before we go in and put the value into the tool. But yeah, yeah so we were kind of afraid that we're going to come out here and show this, and person, everybody will so be like, Ugh, "What is this crap? <laughs> <laughs> Who needs so this?" If, if people would like to use the tool, we will of course be happy to provide that information. So, okay. Okay. Good. Good. So Great. We thank will, you. We will be happy to provide that and and conditionals soon. <laughs> that would be a good one. Uh oh. Tobin. Oh no. <laughs> Nice job, guys. Um, will you be able to generate SDL from the code? Yeah, so the idea we were trying to put is, you know, when you have the diagraph actually complete, the idea would be you could write your own Yeah, maybe I forgot to mention that when we build we build the diagraph, and the edge data has actually all the information. It has the Everything. event, yeah. it has the guard, but it also has the body of the function clause. So if you need to figure some, take something out of inside the code, you can do that. It's just our visualizations don't do that right now. Yeah, and, and I think somebody left a snippet of code that does almost that somewhere in your repos. <laughs> Just guessing. OK. We'll talk. <laughs> Is that it? All right. Uh, let's thank the speakers once again. Give it up for... Uh,